Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Are we ready to get back in our Father's Word, the great book of Isaiah? Yahweh's salvation. That's what it's all about, is His tender love for His people. Now, uh, He has promised in His teaching that when, when you get a bunch of hypocrites trying to pass off as teaching the Word of God as we as we have uh, learned concerning false teaching here in this um, uh, ninth chapter that we're now teaching from, the leaders of the people err is what he said and just had completed doing that and mislead them. Teach falsely. Our Father doesn't appreciate that and He will not tolerate it. Therefore, what He's doing here in a prophetic sense, He's calling down Assyria, the Assyrian. And the Assyrian's going to conquer the children. God's going to use him as a whipping boy, okay? But there's one thing I want you to know, and, and prophetically, this goes all the way to the Assyrian, which is a type name for Antichrist, okay? And um, how fantastic it is that our Father gives us these truths, but at the same time, He taught us in the last uh, lecture Emmanuel, God with us. If God is with you, you don't have to worry about things like that. He'll take care of you. He loves you. He's not angry at you. When you stay in His Word, not man's traditions, but in His Word, God's not angry at you. So you can walk wherever you want to, do in His work, and He will always be with you. He will always take care of you. But don't cross Him, because when you do, this, this um, uh, whipping boy that he calls down on us, and which is really, uh, he allows Satan to clean your plow, if you, uh, to put it in a good old country saying, okay, you don't have to put up with that. All you have to do is love your father and follow his word. Having said that, uh, chapter 9, verse 18, let's pick it up there if we may, and uh, let's go with it. And uh, verse 18 reads, for wickedness burneth as the fire. That, that's what it'll do. It shall devour the briars and thorns and shall kindle in the thickets of the forest and they shall mount up like the lifting up of smoke. In other words, it destroys you. Wickedness will destroy you, your family. It just does you in, okay? 19, the, the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land through rather the wrath of the Lord of hosts the, is the land darkened and the people shall be as the fuel of the fire. No man shall spare his brother. Most of them don't even know who their brother is or, or concerning the house of Israel or the house of Judah or even servants of God. Uh, kinship and family is important to our father. Almighty God. And he wants to be called Father because he does love his children. And as long as you love him, that's fine. You don't love him, he's going to correct you. You can count on it. And wickedness will, call, will, will set your house on fire, spiritually speaking, and you'll just go up in smoke. Everything you got will go up in smoke. You won't amount to a hill of beans. Verse 20, and he shall Snatch on the right hand, I'd rather translate, he will cut on the right hand and be hungry. And he shall eat on the left hand, and they shall not be satisfied. They shall eat every man the flesh of his arm. In other words, that's what civil war does to you. And Ephraim and Manasseh uh, and um, Judah were fighting and pulling the Assyrian in on top of it. That's civil war. And that will destroy a people. That it will not stand, and it really, our Father gets very unhappy with that. Verse 21 Manasseh, Ephraim, and Ephraim, Manasseh. 
He doesn't want you to miss. That's the ten tribes that went north. That's the ten tribes that the Assyrian will take captive. And they together shall be against Judah. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. That, won't, that doesn't satisfy the Father. If they won't get into his plan, if they won't get into his word and stay with it, uh, all your civil wars or anything you try to do w will not please God. Uh, heathenism is a poor excuse for civilization. Heathenism will never pass the muster in pleasing Almighty God. Chapter 10, verse 1. Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees and that right grievousness which they have prescribed. In other words, shame. Shame on those that decree unrighteousness. That means false decrees that teach falsely, that won't teach truth chapter by chapter and verse by verse, that mislead God's children. He says, shame on you. This upsets him terribly. If he writes us a letter, our Father has. That's what the Bible is. It's a letter from Him. And men start cutting that up and sawing at it rather than teaching chapter by chapter and verse by verse whereby the Word of God flows. He's not happy. You can't blame Him. Verse 2. To turn aside the needy from judgment. That's to say what's right. And to take away the right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey, and that they may rob the fatherless. In other words, uh, the church that's supposed to help the people, that is supposed to teach the people, well, uh, rob actually senior citizens, tell them if you'll send a little you-know-what along, we'll get a prayer answered for you. They're liars. God doesn't charge money for pray answers, prayers. But God said it would come to this, that you would absolutely have people making unrighteous decrees. Like, you send me money and I'll see that your bills are paid. Liars. Absolutely out and out liars and to the, high, to the sin of all sins. God said it would happen and hey, look around you. Look around you. It comes to pass. You want to do what's right for those that need help. They need the Word of God. They need the love of God to strengthen them. Verse 3, And what will you do in the day of visitation? Uh-oh. And in the desolation which shall come from far. You can count on it. God's going to bring it. To whom will you flee for help? And where will you leave your glory? Who are you going to praise to whenever you've made all this up? And, you know, um, what are you going to do when that day comes? You know, I know what a lot of them are going to do ultimately. They're going to pray for the mountains to fall on them because they've worshipped the, the uh, Assyrian, which is to say the type of Antichrist. But, you want to stick with the Word of God. Okay. Verse 4. Without me they shall bow down under the prisoners, and they shall fall under the slain. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Um, I'm still going to be angry. And um, you may need help, but I'm not going to help you. Not when you're praying to somebody else or calling to somebody else. Now, again, I want to remind you again, if you stay with the Word, if you stay with Almighty God, not some fake, and not listen to a bunch of frauds, God loves you. You don't have anything to worry about. He will help you, always. Even in the middle of the aggression by even the Antichrist, he will still take care of you. Why? Emmanuel, God with us. When you've got him with you, 
He will take care. But God will use the enemy as his whipping boy, okay, to, to do his correcting. Let's get it from the next verse, verse 5. O Assyrian, this is that type of Antichrist. The rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I'm going to use him to straighten my people out. Six, I will send him against an hypocritical nation. And against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. And there the little prophetess, the child offspring who was told to be named um, hasten to the spoil and speedy to the prey. It comes to pass in that verse. Okay. And so it does. Who's in control? Our Father. Now, again, I would remind you, as long as you obey Him and as long as you love Him and let Him know it, you don't have to worry about this. Not if you were parked right in the very center of it. He takes care of His own. Verse 7, Howbeit he meaneth not so, neither doth his heart think so. That's to say the Assyrian. The Assyrian, what does he say? But it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. I mean, to the lawless one is to take them all. And in, in his own heart, he thinks, I'm the one doing this, when it's God that's allowing him. Okay. Only God allows. Verse 8, For he saith, Are not my princes altogether kings? Boy, they, they're an army that I can count on. They take everything that gets in front of them. I'm so very proud of them. Verse 9, Is not Kalno as Karkichmish? Is not Hamath as Arphad? That means spread out. And is not Samaria as Damascus? In other words, what, what you have here when he says this, you have a road in a straight line from Nineveh to Jerusalem where he's marching and taking everything. Verse 10. As my hand hath found the kingdoms of the idols, and whose graven images did excel them of Jerusalem and of Samaria. Do you, do you understand what the Assyrian called your father? An idol. Now he's kind of stepping over the bounds here. And Whenever a, a, a good follower of Jesus Christ, of Yahweh, our Heavenly Father, won't tolerate that. He won't tolerate someone to say that Almighty God to worship Him is idol worship. Verse 11, Shall I not, as I have done unto Samaria and her idols, so do to Jerusalem and her idols? I mean, this is probably Sargon, Sennacherib's son, as he makes his little march. I'm going to do the same thing to it. I'm going to attack, I'm going to take it. Now he took the ten tribes, but you know, uh, he didn't take the tribe of Judah. That's history, and it's God's word. Okay. Verse 12. Wherefore it shall come to pass, not maybe it's going to come to pass that when the Lord hath performed His whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his looks. I will put him where he belongs. I'll punish him also. My, my father's king of kings, Lord of lords, always will be. That's why you want to stay with him because he controls And, you know, the beauty of it is he always lets us know beforehand what's going down. You see, in a prophetic sense, this is the same thing that happens in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that Jesus Christ will not return until the Assyrian, the son of perdition, which is to say the Antichrist, stands in Jerusalem, this city, this one we're talking about, claiming to be God. He will be allowed to do that. But... 
you don't go there. Why? Because you know he's a fraud. You know he's a fake. And you know that we have power over all of our enemies, including him. What? In the name of Jesus Christ. So, therefore, you are immune by being under the crown of the King of Kings. You are inoculated with the Holy Spirit that protects you from any enemy as long as you utilize common sense. So uh, the main point is from that verse 12, God's in control. He's going to stay in control. Verse 13, For he saith, By the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent, and I have removed the bounds of the people and have robbed their treasures, and I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. I've done it. I've done it. No, he didn't. God allowed it. But you see, now he's getting a little carried away, and God always has a way of bringing things back into line. But, beloved, it shall come to pass that the false Christ is going to... That's why Christ becomes the stumbling block that you were warned about in the last lecture. That many will think He is the Christ. I speak of the, the, the one this is a type of that shall ultimately come. We mentioned, forementioned in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And He will deceive many. And they will fall. They will stumble. In ignorance they will think. Why? Because they haven't studied God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse to know the truth. Don't fall. Don't stumble. Let Christ be your Savior, which He's supposed to be, not a stumbling block. Verse 14, And my hand hath found as a nest the riches of the people. And as one gathereth eggs that are left, have I gathered all the earth. And there was none that moved the wing, or opened the mouth, or peeped. You know, why? Because they're deceived. Unfortunately, when you get to the four hidden dynasties, the hidden dynasty of the economy is a dandy, okay? Nations pay interest into it. Nations literally are held bondage by it. And it's a subject that certainly isn't well discussed because it's certainly not popular. But um, we, we have the Federal Reserve System, which many Americans think, well, that's federal. No, it isn't. It's not federal-owned. It's owned privately. God's Word always comes to pass as it's written. Verse 15, Shall the axe boast itself against him that heweth therewith? Or shall the saw magnify itself against him that shaketh it? There could be a whole lot of shaking going on here, all right as if the rod should shake itself against them that lift it up? Or is it the staff, or as if the staff should lift up itself, and if it were no wood? In other words, that's not going to happen. The axe doesn't control the person. In other words, God has allowed him to do this. He's God's axe. Okay. And... Um, He's, uh, back to verse 5, what did it say? O Syrian, the rod of mine anger. The Assyrian was simply the rod in the hand of God. You got it? And that's what God wants you to know, that he's in charge. He's in control. He only allowed this, and he used it to accomplish what has been accomplished. And quite frankly, he has allowed what has been accomplished on the people of this world today. That's why you want to grow familiar with His Word. Verse 16, Therefore shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, that, that's the Lord and the multitude of the host, send among His fat ones leanness, and under His glory He shall kindle a burning, like the burning of a fire. That wickedness shall destroy them. Goes up in smoke. And... You know, of course, that our Father is a consuming fire, and He is in control. 
Hey, again, I like to comfort. I like to share the good news. And the good news is if you love the Father, you don't have to worry about any of this. He's just letting you know why He's doing it and how He will accomplish it and uh, how that He takes care of His own, Emmanuel, God with us. Verse 17, And the light of Israel shall be for a fire, and His Holy One for a flame, and it shall burn and devour His thorns and His briars in one day. Do you know what day that is? It's the Lord's Day, of course. And um, uh, lies fall and truth reigns supreme. It's going to happen and it's coming and the truth will set you free. It certainly will. And um, uh, it is amazing, amazing that our Father takes care of His own. Our Father does for His own. Verse 18 and shall consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful field, both soul and body, that's flesh body, and they shall be as when a standard beareth feigneth. In other words, um, um, this is where Satan is condemned, basically. You know what? An army can't succeed unless it has a standard bearer. That's what carries it forward. That's what gives the orders. That's what, that's what you bear on. Verse 19, And the rest of the trees of his forest shall be few, that a child may write them. Now, um, we know what his standard is. What, what is the standard as far as numbers and trees are concerned. Well, when how many trumps do you have? You've got seven. A child can count them. A child knows what happens on the sixth trump. It's not difficult for a child to understand. Our father's saying, this isn't complicated. It's, it's just something that everyone can count by the number as it goes down, especially in the end times, where the shaking comes, where the deception happens. And a child knows that Satan comes on the sixth seal, the sixth trump, and the sixth vial, that's six, six, six. Well, and a child can still count to seven, like a lot of adults apparently can't. They can't count with the book of Revelation that numbers the trees, the planting of God, 777. Seven, seven. That's the number of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, our Savior, our standard bearer, the one that is anointed, the one under whose banner we, we sail under whose banner we succeed, under whose banner we have the victory. Child can count it. Verse 20, And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon, stay upon him that smote them but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, the truth. And who is the truth? The Savior is the truth, the Word, the living Word, the Word that became flesh and walked among us, He that was crucified and resurrected, He that is still to this day in charge, the real truth, the truth that sets us free, free from the anxieties and the lies brought on by hypocrites, and stays with the real truth of Almighty God's Word, whereby there is no deception by the false one. That remnant is God's elect, chosen before the foundations of this earth. If you don't understand that, put it on the shelf. Verse 21, The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. That's to say God's elect. They'll never leave Him, they'll stay with Him. 22, for though my people 
For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return, the consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. The, the consummation, I'd rather translate it, the full end. It can come and that decree will overflow them with righteousness. That is to say with that that is right. Why? Because they are chosen of God. And God uses them, guides them, and directs them. By what? Well, by the Holy Spirit and by these words, by this letter, this letter of love that He has written us, whereby you're not deceived, whereby you don't stumble. Verse 23, For the Lord God of hosts shall make a consumption, a full end, even determined in the midst of all the land. It's coming, and that's why that we have to bring the pr prophetic end into this. That is to say, the prophecy as it comes to pass, because that's what ultimately that day is, the Lord's day, that the, all these events transpire, and that full end shall be. God's going to make that full end, and He pulls His elect in to see that it happens. You know, some of you have known there was more to God's Word than you had been taught since you were a child. It's very possible you could be one of those elect. Uh, verse 24, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, He includes the whole family, the host, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrians, he shall smite thee with a rod and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. It didn't amount to much. Okay. They, they escaped from there with a lot more than they went in with in Egypt, though they were in captivity there for many hundreds of years. 25. For yet a little while, and the indignation shall cease, and mine anger in, in their destruction, it's going to come to pass. Verse 26, And the Lord of hosts shall stir up a scourge for him according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. And as his rod was upon the sea, so shall he lift, up, lift it up after the manner of Egypt. And of course, that scourge is against the false Christ and that that comes. Do you know, do you know uh, what happened there at Midian? What happened at Oreb? Uh, we're going to go, I'm, you're not going to have it. I'm going to take you back to 2 Kings chapter 19. And I'm going to pick it up with verse 34. And this is what he's talking about. That's why he said, you don't have to worry about it as long as you're in with the Father. As long as you're uh, with Emmanuel, Emmanuel, that is to say, God with us. Verse 34 of 2 Kings 19. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Verse 35. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians an hundred fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpse. And Sennacherib king of Assyria departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. I would guess he would. When God is ready to put a stop to it, he puts a stop to it. Our father is very much in charge. And Sennacherib and Sargon on their road back to Nineveh knew that God was the God of heavens, the God of hosts, that he was the one that's in charge. They certainly didn't call him an idol God after that. He showed them when that angel of the Lord, which is the presence of the Lord, hit them that night. It was an awesome slaughter against the enemies of, of God, though he had utilized them as a rod of correction to get the attention of his elect. 
You know, you want to really pay close attention, especially in this generation, in this world that is so troublesome. That is to say, the, the spirit so evil in this world today that are rampant, that run wild, that murder innocents. Be awake. Be very awake. Our Father is still very much in control. He says, I'll take care of that city when that time comes. Verse 27 to continue. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. The anointing of what? Well, what does Christ mean? Christos, the anointed one, because of Christ, because we have that yoke which is Jesus Christ on us. What does a yoke do? It makes the work a lot easier. It makes the, the tugs that pull the load not be able to cut into the shoulder, but the yoke eases that load up, and Christ is our yoke, and Christ is the anointed one. And when you are under that anointing, then you have God's protection. You have it both night and day. You have it as long as you utilize common sense and as long as you let Him know you love Him. You don't, you don't have anything to worry about, even in these end times, in this troubled world, if God is with you, Emmanuel, God with us. This is the lesson he is teaching us here in this great book of Isaiah. And it is a lesson, especially in this generation, you want to pay, pay very close attention to. When God says, I'm going to destroy them, when God says, I'm going to take care of it, you can rest assured that's exactly what he's going to do. He intends to take care of it. He shall take care of it. Don't ever forget the anointed one. It's sure a lot better, that child named Emmanuel, than the one that rushes to the, to the uh, prey, r rushes to the destruction and speedy to the prey. You don't, you don't want any part of that. You want to be with our Heavenly Father, His love, His understanding. Always do what is right as best you can. Do not be one of those that messes up righteousness. That is to say, teaches falsely. Teach God's Word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular CDs. How and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you have always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska. Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, church, or organization. Let's don't judge people. That's God's business. He's the judge, and he's quite capable. Those of you that listen by short wave, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Now, you got a prayer request. You don't need a number. You don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. God created you unique from all other people. You've got different fingerprints, your personality pretty well different, especially your DNA. Why? He wanted someone just like you. But, and He wants you most of all to love Him. That's what He wants from you. Don't forget to tell Him. Do that, won't you? Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, 
guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and we'll get right into the questions. We got Vincent from Canada. Question, does Adam and Eve have a chance to be saved? Of course they do. As it is written in um, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, Jesus, through, uh, while yet in the tomb, went all the way back to Noah's time, which means the beginning, to Adam and Eve, and gave them the opportunity of believing upon Him and salvation. And it's only right that they should because it would be uh, through Adam and Eve that uh, God would give Satan the sentence of the enmity between his seed and the woman's seed in Genesis 3.15. Uh, who taught you the Bible? Well, uh, many years of study, research, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and thank God for cl clarity of understanding. Wendy from Canada. I've been studying with your program for about two months. My question is about Mary Magdalena. What exactly do you mean that she was betrothed to Jesus? Where in Scripture may it be found? Now, you, you probably misunderstood. You probably heard me say that because it is written historically that Mary Magdalena was betrothed to Christ, which all Christians are. That's the thing of Christianity. We're all betrothed to Jesus Christ for that great wedding that is uh, going to take place described in Matthew chapter 25. Okay, And... Um, uh, and that wedding will take place. It's a spiritual wedding, all right? But many people that are non-Christians that do translating, naturally, when they saw the word betrothed, which, which simply means engaged to be married, not married, engaged to be married in the Greek, okay? Uh, then that many of us are, okay? Or I should really say the Hebrew. You won't find it in the Greek. Uh, Louise from Illinois. My question is, who are Libya, Gomer to Gomor? Well, let's take Libya. It's Libya of today. It's still the same country. Gomer and to Gomor are Russia. And, of course, Iran is uh, Persia of old. When you speak of medial Persia, you got it. Jim from Oklahoma. I have a question that I can't figure out the answer to. You say that God loves his animals and so pets like my dog Thunder will be in heaven. Since God also made insects and worms, will they be in heaven too? Well, our Father has a way. He, you got to have it, must bear in mind. We're going to be getting to chapter 11 very soon. And what you have to realize, there is a change where there will be no more carnivores. And you have to figure that in, you have to apply that, and just kind of, you, your um, application would probably be as well off as mine of what will be and won't be. Uh, we know that the bear is still there, but it's no longer a carnivore. So God loves his animals, but there are changes, okay? Um, Evelyn from Tennessee. You seem to resent the use of the word rapture to describe 1 Thessalonians 4.17. The theory is not the same to save souls, but for ones who are already saved to take part in it. You use not only words, but phrases such as the first earth age to describe some of Genesis. Why? Because that's what it was. That's what the Bible says. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Tuhu vabuhu in the Hebrew tongue, in the manuscripts. The first earth age became void and without form. Okay? It's there. That's why I teach it, because it's biblical. Just how do you interpret 1 Thessalonians 4.17? After all, it only has to be in the Bible one time to be true. Uh, why, why do you say, why do you start with 17? This is why a lot of people are certainly ignorant of God's Word, okay? Because you can't start at 17 and understand what's being talked about. Because the subject is identified all the way back in the 13th verse and 14th verse. 
Therefore, when you read that, then you know what 17 is talking about and you won't let some hypocrite deceive you. Okay. Because what does it say in 13? It says, I don't want you to be ignorant like the heathen are concerning where the dead are as the subject. If you believe Christ rose from the dead and you better, you're not a Christian, then you better believe that all those that sleep or are dead in him are, have risen also and are with him. In other words, the dead rise first. That's the subject. Meaning, the, uh, verse 17, they're already out of here. They're gone. They're with the Father and praise God for it. Come on, get with it. Get with the program. Uh, Bovel from North Carolina. Uh, what does the number 15 mean in biblical text? The number 15 means rest. Well, why does it mean rest? Well, the two main holidays, the feast days, great Sabbaths of God's Word, and Sabbath means rest, fall the first one, which is our Passover, that time that the Passover lamb came forth, is the 15th day of the first month. And the second great rest, Sabbath, comes in the seventh month on the 15th day, and it's the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, But those are the high Sabbaths for Christianity. They come on 15, and 15 means rest. 15 means Sabbath. Why? Because Christ became our Sabbath. Christ became our rest. Uh, Linda from Pennsylvania. If a person is given the truth about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and will not accept that truth while they are in the flesh, and they pass away, how is it possible to have a chance during the millennium? I know you say there is no second chance, but that is the way it sounds, can you please explain uh, more thoroughly? Well, I'd be happy to. In the first place, <clears throat> you're setting yourself up as judge. Okay. You're, you're saying they knew all the truth. How do you know they knew the truth? You're judging that they have the truth. Do you know the truth yourself? Do you know the truth well enough that you can say everybody has the whole truth? Do they have the truth that the false Messiah comes first? Have they warned their brethren? Then if, they don't, if they're void of that, they're not part of the remnant. Therefore, they certainly don't have the truth. Therefore, they don't have a chance. And uh, dear Linda, have you never read Romans chapter 11 where God himself sent the spirit of slumber upon some whereby they can't see the whole truth? Okay. So no, you need to leave judgment to God. There are no such thing as a second chance. That's the only reason that the unforgivable sin by, can be created, be done or accomplished by one of God's elect. That's to say somebody that truly knows the truth. And because all the others in ignorance, there is no sin. God does not give second chances, period. Vicki from Texas, do you have a mark on you before you will be able to buy food or clothes or other things? And I said, no, you have to worship the Antichrist. That's where you receive the mark is in your forehead, meaning you believe he is the true Christ. Therefore, you worship him and you receive from him, and boy, is he going to be happy to take care of you, okay? A chicken in every pot. And um, that's what, why most people will flow to him. They will truly think he is the true Christ. And, and there is no such thing as a mark on the forehead. It's in the forehead. That's where your brain is. That's what you're supposed to use so you're not deceived. Uh, Lori from Arkansas. When we ask God for forgiveness, are we also required by God to go to the person which we are wanting forgiveness from and ask them as well? You kind of have to use your own judgment on that. Be sure that you ask the Father. But the other end of that is that some people where you know it might be dangerous or, or could cause more harm than good, 
But the main thing is ask our Father for forgiveness. And the rest of that, you have to kind of be your own judge, okay, as to whether you ask that person for forgiveness. A Christian, you can always ask for, for their forgiveness. I'll say that again. A Christian, you can always ask them for forgiveness. And if they're a true Christian, they will forgive, most likely. Now, you got to remember, and the reason I've answered the be beginning of this as I did, not all that claim to be Christians are, okay? They're Christians only by convenience. Uh, Kim from Tennessee, can you please explain Genesis chapter 6, verse 12? Ishmael will be a wild man, or these people who now follow Muhammad? Yeah, the, a large part of them do, yeah. And um, Hagar's son, Ishmael, he had uh, 12 um, sons, and they were leaders of that, the Arab world. Deborah from Pennsylvania, can you explain what the Word teaches about blood? Some believe we are not to use our blood to save other lives. To abstain from blood means don't eat or drink it, but... What is the sin of donating it to save a life? Is that a sin? Absolutely not. Now, I, I want to tell you what the, where most people fall short. All God instructed was that when you butcher an animal, be sure you bleed it. Don't eat the blood. Why? Because it putrefies. The meat will not keep if you do not bleed it. Yeah. Th this is a common practice even to this day. When cattle are butchered, they are bled. When chickens are butchered, they are bled. When any animal that is to be consumed, they are bled. Or the, if the blood does not drain out, the meat is not fit to eat. Okay. So this is, and especially in olden times when there was no refrigeration or anything of that nature, it became extremely important in the health laws. That's all it was, was the health law. That um, uh, this is why you wouldn't eat a chicken that was strangled, okay? It's got to be bled, and that, that makes it healthy. It has nothing whatsoever to do with blood transfusions uh, or, or anything of that nature. Simply a health law for food. Manual from Texas. Jehovah and Jesus, are they one and the same, or are, these two, are there two separate gods? There's only one God, and you don't ever want to even think that there were two gods. That's, that's, you will place no God before Almighty God. Okay. This is why you must know um, your name is Manuel, which comes from Emmanuel, which means God with us. Okay. That explains it. Uh, Mike from Tennessee, could you please uh, clear up my problem with Romans 12, 16, this part, be of the same mind one toward another. I understand, but I am lost with the rest of the verse. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. What it is, is be concerned, be concerned, uh, don't be high-minded. Don't think you know it all. Okay, But be concerned of men of low estates. That's to say handicapped or people that are, are on their way up. They're learning. Help teach. Bring them up gently. Don't embarrass them. Uh, be comforting to them. Help them and lead them. That's what it means. And be not wise in your own conceits means to know it all. Don't be a know-it-all again. Um, so there, you always, you know, it, when you teach, it isn't important that a new person must know how much you know, okay? There's, there's not a way in the world, if you are well-founded in, in a student of God's Word, that you can take a brand new person and convey all you know biblically to that person. You have to go to their level so, and don't try to impress on them how much you know, but feed them gently 
and bring them along to that which their appetite can uh, afford them, okay, that they can handle and bring them on up uh, that way, okay. It, it's, that's what's important is to be able to help those that need help without overpowering them. Uh, Branson, age 12, from Indiana. If the Bible says love your enemies, then is it a sin to join the army? No, not at all. Fantastic, marvelous. What, what is it you're supposed to do to a child if, um, if, if he needs an attitude adjustment? You're supposed to correct them, and you're not supposed to spare the rod. Well, so it is with your enemy. If you love them, sometimes they need an attitude adjustment. And um, certainly we have to, that's what we have our troops for, is to give attitude adjustments. And so it is. No, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be in the army that makes this a nation whereby we have freedom of religion and that our children are free. And yours truly, has, I've shed blood to keep this nation free. I don't regret that one iota. Uh, on, in combat, on the field of honor, to, so that we have the right to practice and be free. Freedom's not cheap. People have paid great prices all the way down and still are for that freedom. So don't ever let some mamby-pamby, panty waste tell you it's a sin to be a military person they're to be respected, and uh, what they do is fantastic. They're servants of Almighty God in this nation and do their families so very proud. No, it's, it's an honor to be able to serve this nation, which usually pretty well does what's right. Now, you've got a few liberal thinking panty waste that... Um, their elevator stops short of the top floor that would tell you different. So be real careful. Use your head and think things through. Okay, Ed from Texas. Is it bad for us to touch leather products made from pig or swine? I bet you're not a football fan, are you? Um, it, um, of course... Leviticus chapter 11 answers your question. It doesn't say you're not supposed to touch the swine. It says you're not supposed to eat the swine. Okay. Um, not too many people eat footballs, okay? but they do touch them a lot, don't they? Tommy from Missouri. How will I know the real Christ from the false one? I find your program great. And, well, thank you. Thank you. Well, how, how do you know the real, the real one? Because the fake comes first, okay? It is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, don't ever let anyone deceive you about our gathering back to Jesus Christ, the true Christ. It's not going to happen until after the son of perdition, that's the Antichrist, Satan, stands in the holy place claiming to be Christ, claiming to be God. He's coming first, and he's going to deceive a lot of people. That first person taken in the field in the 24th chapter of Matthew is taken by Satan, not the true Christ. So you sure don't want to be that first one deceived because um, you would no longer be a spiritual virgin and you would never take part of the wedding to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, okay, we got uh, Margaret from Virginia. Uh, question, from time to time, you make reference to the Dome of the Rock. What is the significance of this? Well, the, the Dome of the Rock is the very top of the mountain on which, which, um, Christ, um, uh, which the original uh, temple was. It is the Temple Mount. It is where the very house of God was, was uh, situated. It is very precious to more than one religion. Um, many people believe that this is where Mohammed resurrected. Some believe this is where Christ resurrected. And the rock is there, 
and there's a dome over that rock. It is a very sacred place. It is still under the control of the Muhammad people, those that worship Muhammad, and, um, and has been up to this date. And, and much said about that, and it's a very tender subject. But um, there's a great deal that hinges on that Dome of the Rock. Okay, Michael from Oklahoma. In what tribe were Jesus as in? Well, he, Jesus was in the, he was of the tribe of Judah, uh, mainly because Mary's father was of the tribe of Judah. And Mary's mother was of the tribe of Levi. So Jesus was of two tribes the tribe of, uh, of Judah and the tribe of Levi, which means the king line and the priest line. Therefore, forever after the order of Melchizedek, he is king of kings and he is lord of lords. The documentation for that you will find in the very first chapter of the great book of Luke. And, uh, and it, the Christmas story bears that out as we give at times. I'm out of time again. Hey, you know what? Love you all a lot for a real special reason. You enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Most of all, God loves you for it. Why? Well, you're studying the letter He sent to you. Why? Because He loves you. Well, let Him know you love Him in return. Won't you do that? We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? When you bless God, He will always bless you. But there's one thing that's far more important, and it's this, that you stay in His Word. Every day in His Word, it's a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yahshua, is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.